Okay, good morning everybody and thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we are here um, for a fantastic event and I'm delighted to welcome um, our guest speakers. Um, let's just start um, with some housekeeping. Uh, we're going to be speaking for about two hours this morning. Um, I'm delighted that we've got this workshop, the Global Real Estate Opportunities Workshop, um, being chaired by myself and uh, Louise. I'm going to be uh, working with our speakers for the first hour and then Louise the second. Um, we have um, Barry um, and Nicola and Andy who are going to be um, presenting for the first 45 minutes or so. Then there'll be an opportunity for questions. Um, and then in the second half, we've got Sham and B who I'll be working with Louise. Um, please can I ask you to keep your cameras uh, probably off if you're not participating, just for bandwidth issues. Um, I've got a few issues this morning, um, but um, and also just to remind you that we are recording this session because it will be of um, a great use afterwards. Um, if you could please put um, questions in the chat, we'll be monitoring the chat and then at the end of each panel uh, session we are able to um, I refer to the chat and also to um, to, to speak live um, as we get on with time. So without further ado, um, I'd like to say thank you very much to our um, our guests this morning or in UK this morning. We, we have you from around the globe. I'm going to stop sharing and we're going to start with Barry, who's going to spend 10 or 15 minutes talking about um, his experience and his um, global life based out of, of um, Hong Kong. So, Barry, without any further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Hold on, I'm just going to share my screen. I'm just going to make sure you guys can see it. Can you guys see that? Yeah, we're good. Wonderful. Good morning, guys. Um, good afternoon over here in Hong Kong. It's uh, Nearly just uh, around 6 p.m. Um, appreciate this time difference over there. So uh, apologies if I was a little bit tired. Um, yeah, so today, um, very honored to be part of this um, sort of little chat with everyone um, at, over back at Sheffield, where I'm from originally. Uh, I'm just going to go over um, very quickly over you know, when I moved over to Hong Kong, when I graduated, um, and just really talk about. Um, you know, how I got to where I am today, uh, a little about Hong Kong and uh, what's it like um, working and living in Hong Kong. So, without further ado, I think this photo must have been Photoshop because I think put on about twenty pounds since then. But um, you know, I, gra I graduated in two thousand seven. Um, sorry, I started business property management at Shinto in two thousand seven. Um, graduated in two thousand ten. Uh, and pretty much shortly afterwards, um, I up, uh, accepted onto the graduate trainee program in Hong Kong. Um, you know, it was actually a firm that I applied for uh, in the UK as well as Hong Kong, but funnily enough, you know, uh, UK just weren't hiring at the time, and I'll go into a little bit more about that later on. Um, uh, I was there for a samples for 10 years, and it was actually just this year, uh, well, actually, it, it, I've just been, I've started over at Sigari, uh, also in Hong Kong, about uh, five months ago, actually. So that's basically what I do and, uh, you know, where I started. Um, very short, sort of a little timeline. Uh, like I said, I uh, graduated in 2010. Um, I actually started um, at Savills in Hong Kong, um, you know, as an intern. Uh, I did four weeks. Um, in the property management team first, and then I begged and pleaded for another four weeks uh, to do uh, a stint to the agency team. Uh, and after that is actually where I got offered a, a role on the uh, graduate training program. Uh, and I was there very happy for 10 years, and like I said, now I'm over at Sigori. So, you know, back to when I graduated in 2010, um, not too dissimilar from now, the world had sort of, you know, grinded down to a halt. Uh, and for those who can still remember 2010, it was probably the worst time to graduate um, in any degree, in any sort of uh, discipline, uh, regardless whether it was finance or real estate. Because um, if you remember, it was, that was when, uh, you know, the, the it's collapsed globally, especially in the US and then go on to Europe, and then of course it affects the UK as well. 
um, you know, um, if you look at the headlines, you know, Lehman Brothers went bust, um, Bank of America bailed out, um, the subprime market went head over heels, uh, and, you know, I was you know, in a serious state of panic when I graduated thinking, you know, had I chosen the wrong degree, you know, uh, what I was going to do for the rest of my career. Um, so, you know, when I graduated in 2010, it was the times, um, you know, not just for myself, but everybody uh, in the UK as well. And I think out of my class who actually studied real estate, I think probably, um, probably five out of 10 people actually got a job in real estate, I think. At the time, people were working. Um, you know, when they graduated, they were working in bars, they were, you know, um, stacking shelves, they were doing all sorts, of anything except real estate. So it was pretty dire times, and uh, you know, it's quite similar to now, in the sense that many employers are looking to employ, um, given the, the, the what was happening with the world. But I think, given that, um, even though it was really bad in 2010, I think you know the world. What it has shown is, you know things kind of rebound very quickly and I think UK and Europe are very well placed um, to, uh, should be well on the way to recovery especially with the vaccination rollout which we're seeing. Um, so a little bit about the firm that I'm working for now, Subari, um, it's a global Fortune 500 company uh, operating in 100 countries worldwide, We've got over 100,000 staff um, you know, operating in the various cities. Um, we're, you know, uh, we're a multidisciplinary sort of business with many, many business lines. So we do property management, we do agency, we do research, we do evaluation, obviously. Um, and just recently, we were ranked globally number one um, across the Americas, Europe, and uh, the EMA, and of course, Asia as well. So um, we're quite a busy, busy company. Um, what I do in particular in Hong Kong is that um, so I work in the agency team, so basically investment sales. Um, any clients with buildings they need to dispose, or basically real estate funds or um, high net worth individuals, I help them acquire or sell their buildings. So basically, um, it's just straight to the commercial brokerage. Um, an example of the type of deals that I do, um, basically we, we sell really anything, but in our team we kind of focus on, on block transactions, so um, anything industrial, shopping malls, hotels, offices, retail podiums, uh, these have assets that we need help trade, um, uh, help our uh, customers uh, buy and sell. So example on the screen I've got now, um, this is an example of the type of deal that we do. Um, I think this was one of the first big deals I did when I moved to Hong Kong. Um, I was working for the developer and we managed to sell this building to a real estate fund for about one and a half billion dollars, which in sterling it's about 150 million pounds. Um, you know, this is a very popular type of asset um, that gets traded in, in these parts of the world. Um, people in Hong Kong love shopping, they love convenience, um, and especially suburban malls. Um, you know, it, 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 it's proven to be a very popular asset class for investors. Um, again, this is another mall that I sold. Uh, back in 2017, uh, Providence Square, um, retail mall in Hong Kong Island. Um, it was priced around about uh, 2 billion, so about 200 million pounds. Uh, in this case, I was working for the seller, who is a uh, Hong Kong listed REIT, and uh, sort of getting sold to a real estate investor for Panthers, which is now actually being bought by a UK company called Schroeder's. So very briefly, I think what people think of Hong Kong, um, skyscrapers, shiny neon signs, um, a big foodie destination, and um, probably what a lot of people don't realize is um, it's actually one of the most densest places uh, on the planet. Um, so yeah, Hong Kong as a city, it's around about a thousand square kilometers, which is about two thirds the size of London. Um, but within that, and the seven million people, and I think per capita is actually one of the densest places on earth. Um, as a result of that, you know, there's a lot of real estate, a lot of transactions that we can work on. So I guess that's quite good if you're a real estate broker. I think what not many people realize is that um, as a global destination, 
um, is actually the number one uh, placed uh, city for IPOs or initial public offerings. So, you know, companies get listed. Um, yeah, Hong Kong is usually the place that they'll go to be listed. Um, mm -hmm. And um, as a result of that, there's a tremendous amount of money and wealth coming to the city. So I took this from uh, our global research. And um, as you can see, uh, London on the left, um, it's still probably the most highly invested city in the world. Uh, Hong Kong's not too bad given the size of you know, it, it's quite a small place. I think we're sort of six or seven on, on the way. This is actually quite a boring slide, but what it really illustrates is the fact that um, the yields for offices, uh, retail buildings, and industrial buildings. Um, if you look at Hong Kong's third uh, bar um, along the left, it actually shows a very, very sort of uh, short and uh, tight yield spread. So basically, in other words, it actually means um, it's very, very expensive to, to buy. Um, if you think about yield and think about cost, if you buy a building for say five percent yield, uh, and your interest uh, sorry uh, interest rate is maybe uh, two or three percent, and your yield is two or three percent, that means you know you're not really making anything. You're not making any money on, on the building that you just bought. In some cases where it's really low yield, you might have to actually pay out extra money just to have the building. So it's a very very expensive market. Uh, I think what's quite interesting is um, the building in the middle is actually uh, that was sold, I think, about three years ago, and that was the most expensive building that's ever been sold on the planet. Um, I think it was 75% of the building was sold for about uh, 40 billion dollars, which is about 4 billion pounds. Um, and, you know, with this amount of wealth, it's obviously understandable that, um, you know, as a market, it's very expensive, whether it's commercial real estate that you know regular investors buy, but also residential stuff uh, that people like you, know, you, you would buy or rent. Back in, I think, last month, um, Chongong, all the developers over there, they actually also saw the most expensive uh, residential flat in Asia. Um, again, uh, it, this wasn't even a particularly uh, um, Sorry, it's a sort of question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and um, I think to translate that into pounds, it's roughly uh, 45 million pounds for a 3,300 3, square foot apartment. So basically, you know, to put that into context, if you look at your desk, um, that's probably about, I don't know, two, two, three, uh, two or three feet um, on a per square foot basis. Um, it's thirteen thousand pounds. Thirteen thousand pounds per square foot. So you know your desk is probably worth around um, the same space of when your desk would cost around about uh, you know thirty forty thousand pounds, which is yeah quite uh, quite, quite crazy money. Anyway, I'm just conscious of time. Um, so you know I'm just going to quickly just jump into what it's like working in Hong Kong. Um, so as I just mentioned, I'm um, working uh, real estate sales, and a big part of my day is uh, servicing clients, speak to my clients. So you know, on a typical day when I wake up at maybe half six, first thing I do, unfortunately, look at my mobile phone. That's quite sad, but um, you know, I have to need to catch up on all my messages, all my more, uh, all, all the news, emails that might you know about transactions that may have happened overnight. the night. Then on the way to work, I'll be going through my schedule. Um, I'll be reading about uh, news and transactions that have happened um, overnight. I'll be looking at the markets, uh, hearing about you know, uh, who bought what, who bought this, who leased where. Um, probably have my breakfast in the office. Uh, that is if I don't have to meet a client for breakfast. First thing I do when I get into the office in the morning is, is again, go through all my emails, plan about my day, start uh, jumping on the phone, start to clients, see if there's anything that we can help them with. Um, that will follow into lunchtime, where usually uh, I'll have a, a, a lunch meeting with one of my clients, uh, and then I'll be, you know, again trying to pitch them on um, a new idea that I have, or a property that's for sale. Uh, basically, tell them about you know the transactions that have happened in the past few weeks or the past few months, give them some color on, on where the uh, real estate market is, 
in that particular sector. Um, usually in the latter part of my day, um, uh, I'll usually sort of less taxing stuff, but basically I, I like to plan uh, a lot of my property inspections um, or, or, or site tours to the to respective buildings. Uh, and usually that's why I take them to uh, have a look at potential buildings that they can buy. Um, afterwards, usually um, I kick start the afternoon quite early with some happy hour drinks. Um, and then they use that opportunity to really, again, get in front of the client and also catch up with them. Uh, and really tell them about anything that's um, new or exciting that's just happened in the market that might help them um, but persuade them to, 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 to look at the building. And, um, usually that will round up the day we're having dinner with them. Then um, uh, hopefully try and get them to sign on something. <laughs> but uh, deals that have it all designed. But uh, you know, uh, in our role, it's a very client-facing job. So you know, a lot of the time, um, I'm actually in the office. Uh, I'll be out getting as much contact time with the clients, with the sellers, with the buyers uh, as possible. So um, yeah, it's quite light out, but uh, ultimately quite rewarding. I think is that about uh, much of all the time we have. <laughs> that's brilliant barry thank you so much sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> no it's it's spot on it's absolutely spot on so great tell you what um so if you could stop sharing your screen that would be really helpful um and um and what i'm going to do if that's okay we'll go through all the three speakers so um uh, apart from thinking that I've only seen Hong Kong by flying in and out the airport and never stopped, so I really must go and have a look at it, um, which would be kind of nice. I'd like to, um, if it's okay, now pass on straight to Nicola, um, and then we'll go from there to Andy and then have questions at the end. So thank you, Nicola. Thank you. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm calling in from, which is the Yugara people of Brisbane, and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. Um, so, who am I? Um, my name is Nicola. I've been living in Brisbane for the last eight years. Before that, I was living in, I'm going backwards now for some reason, Melbourne, Sydney, London, Sheffield. Um, prior to Sheffield, I'd done an undergraduate degree at Aston University in Birmingham. And um, I would like to think that I graduated into just as bad an environment as Barry. And I was actually thinking that I could steal his slides and just change the year to 1993, because that was also a really bad recession. Um, most of my friends that I graduated with from Aston um, didn't get jobs for a, at least a year or two after graduating. Um, you couldn't even get a job at Sainsbury's coffee shop um, for love and money at that time. It was it was pretty bad. Um, but I'm also showing my age now about how much older than Barry I am too, which is why I'm not going to show you a timeline either. Um, so I did um, property valuation and management at Sheffield, and I will share. I've, I've not done a slide presentation because I. To be honest, I was thinking with you guys all being in lockdown, the last thing you really want to see is lots of pictures of koalas and exciting things like that. Now, if you can, can you see my screen now? Um, we don't use Zoom very often, so I'm showing my complete lack of skill with Zoom. Um, oh, am I showing a completely different screen? Am I showing a blank screen? No, all is good, Nicola, all is good. So can you see a photo or can you see a blank screen? No, we can see the photo now. Great. So that's my that's my cohort of graduates from the property valuation um, team in 1994. I'm the very shiny faced person at the front who has absolutely no wrinkles and has definitely never been near the sunshine. Um, so I'm I'm still one of the youngest looking people in Australia because I didn't see the sun until I was in my 20s. Um, I was really lucky when in 1993, when I was graduating, I actually got sponsored by the valuation office to do the property valuation and management course. And there were 10 people in our year who got sponsored. And the really good thing about that was that we were actually guaranteed a job at the end of it for four years. So we also had to sign up for four years, which at 21 was quite a daunting prospect. So I did my degree. I moved to London to work at the valuation office and spent four um, pretty exciting years in the in the 90s living the dream in London which basically meant um, a lot of partying a lot of really really hard work and a bit more partying um, I think it would be fairly safe to say um, I did my RICS qualification during that time and after after the four years were up um, I went out and looked to I, I was wanting to specialize in something so I've been purely doing valuation for tax purposes 
and I ended up um, specialising in capital allowances, which is a very niche little area of property taxation. And I went to work for Arthur Anderson, which um, I'm guessing that if you're a grad, if you're still studying at the moment, probably had disappeared by the time you were born. Um, but it was a it was one of the at the time big five accounting firms, and it all fell into a heap because of a big accounting scandal in Texas. But um, there's a film you can watch about that if you want more information. You don't need me to tell you about that. Um, after a couple of years of that, I was um, I was I was kind of I know this is like the whole you're tired of London, you're tired of life kind of thing. But um, me and my flatmate, we were sitting having a chat one day, and we thought it'd be really nice to go to New Zealand travelling. Um, but at the time we were looking at, they'd run out of visas for the year, so we ended up getting visas to come to Australia. So we we packed in our jobs and we packed our backpacks and we headed out to Australia for a year um, with a working with working holiday visas. So I would uh, the title of the movie is the smartest man in the smartest men in the room. Um, just I saw that pop that that pop up. Um, so I. I came out to Australia with one of my friends and I was always very sensible and I'd always save lots of money. So I'd got, you know, a, I could, I could not work for a few months um, and sort of sit on the beach and all of that. And my friend wasn't quite so sensible and she came to Australia with about, I don't know, $5 in her back pocket. So after a couple of months, she'd run out of cash and I was bored of sitting on the beach on my own. So I got a job and I called a company up that, specialised in capital ounces and said, hey, this is my background. Um, have you got anything? And they said, sure, come on in and have a chat and literally gave me a three month contract over the, the strength of a phone call. Um, so I worked there for three months, um, which was how long you were allowed to work for somewhere on that particular visa. And about two months in, they said, we'd like you to stay. Like, OK, so I ended up um, I ended up staying and staying and staying and 21 years later I'm still in Australia <laughs> um, so it kind of was a bit of an accident but what was what was really interesting to me about Australia having worked in London and the structures and um, the way that um, the way that work was set up in in London and in the UK generally I think was very different when I came to Australia and within two years of being here I quit my job and got my permanent residency and started my own business. Now, that is not something I think I would have done had I had I stayed in the UK. Um, we basically, there were three of us. We had $6,000 between us, which at the time was probably, I don't know. Well, it was literally enough to buy three laptops. Laptops were very expensive back then. We bought three laptops, three cameras, and we, and we paid for some professional indemnity insurance and we started our own business doing um, capital allowances, which basically was going out, looking at buildings, um, creating asset registers and, and claiming tax deductions for our clients. Um, we did that for nine years. We built it up to a company with 25 people. And around that time was the time when the GFC hit. So we quickly contracted back to five people. And um, about two years later, having, having weathered that, we sold to a bigger QS firm. Um, and I did that for five years. I was a director on, of, of that business and um, I left there about two years ago to join KPMG as a partner. Um, the team I run at KPMG um, looks after um, all, a, a, a quite a wide variety of property related topics. So we will do the capital allowances, the same thing that I've sort of been specialising in for that whole time. But we also do um, technical due diligence on property transactions as well. So it's, it's, it's very much part of the transaction world that, that Barry is also in. So we will look at any commercial, commercial buildings. We'll ha we have engineers, we have chartered building surveyors, um, chartered quantity surveyors, um, we have valuers in the business, we have chartered accountants. Um, I, when I came to Australia, um, because of my love of tax, I also am dual qualified. I've got a master's of tax, which is um, way more fun than it actually sounds. Um, so, so that's kind of, I guess, what my journey's been um, to get to, to get to sort of like the like partnership at KPMG. You've probably heard of KPMG. It's a, um, one of the big four accounting firms. Um, we've got offices in 146 countries. There's about 220, 230,000 people work there. But on the flip side, 
our teams that we work with are actually quite small, but we're connected globally. So um, it's, what time are we at? It's half past eight at night here. And this isn't the only night that I'll be doing a call to the UK. I'll be having a call to the UK um, almost exactly the same time next week um, with our UK partnership to talk about the way that they do their capital allowances and the, the technology that we use and we can share. So it's, um, my team is quite small. Um, I, I'm, I'm sort of, I look after eight people in Brisbane and I look after eight people in Perth. Um, and just because of timing, I haven't actually met any, I've actually met, only met one of the people in Perth because we're still not allowed to fly internally and haven't been for the last year. Um, but it's, um, it's, it's, it, it still feels like you're in really nice small groups of, uh, of people to work with as well. You don't just get lost in the, in the big machine. Um, in terms of the real estate market in Australia, obviously we are, we're, we're a vast country and it's, it's really, even after I've been here for a while, it still blows you away sometimes when you're flying to Perth, for example, you know, it's, it's a four and a half hour flight. And in fact, if you're flying into the, um, into the headwinds, it can take six hours to get to the other side of the country in a plane. Um, and even to get to Cairns, which is in, so Brisbane's in Queensland, Cairns is also in Queensland. It's a two and a half hour flight in a big jumbo jet. It's not just like hopping down the road. You can't just jump in your car and drive to the next city. Or you can, but you need to make sure you've got a lot of snacks with you. Um, it's, and we've only got, we've got 25 million people. Then in terms of the real estate market, what that really means is that we've only got, um, we've only really got four, four main markets being Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane and Perth. And really Brisbane and Perth are fairly fairly niche markets, I guess it's fair to say. And then we've also got Canberra, that's the capital. Um, and then there's, there's places like Adelaide. Um, and it's, it's a, so it makes for quite interesting dynamics because those places are all quite far away. Um, obviously, 2020, in terms of what the market was doing, was very, um, th there were very few transactions compared with what we normally, normally see. So I thought I'd give you a bit of a flavour of what happened in 2019, which was a much, much more... I guess, regular year. So in the calendar year 2019, there were about 700 property transactions in the, in the commercial space, um, which totaled about $45 billion of, of assets, which is about 22 million, sorry, 22 billion pounds, um, which was quite a big year dollar-wise because there was one or two extremely large transactions um, that really pushed that number up, one being a, a shopping centre, a $2 billion shopping centre in Adelaide, which must cover half of Adelaide from my knowledge of the Adelaide market. Um, half of the transact, half of that 700 transactions, so 350 of those, um, were um, basically the, uh, the investor was from Asia. So you can see that that's obviously with COVID, that's had a huge, one of the reasons why there was such a huge impact on the number of transactions last year, because people just haven't been able to come over, come over and see that. Um, and out of the 45 billion, seven and a half billion was just from the US and Singapore. So we have a, um, we have a massive, um, massive influx of capital into Australia. And one of the reasons for that is the transparency of the market. And it's very easy, very easy to do business here because of that. So um, in terms of the global real estate transparency index, UK is number one, USA is number two, and Australia is number three. I have my own theory as to why, um, why Australia is so popular. I think it's like a lot of people actually just want to come and visit. And so it's a really good place to come and do an asset tour. Um, and we do get a lot of people coming through and doing that. Um, we also, there's also a very high um, focus on sustainability within the Australian market. And in terms of our, um, our big real estate investment trust that we have, they're all really focused on that and have been for, for probably the last 20 years and have been some of the first movers in that area um, with some of the, um, I guess, some of the social goals as well as some of the, um, the, uh, the, the green building things as well. Um, in terms of what it's like to live and work here, I'll be fairly quick about this, but there is some really good things and some really bad things. So if you're watching the news at the moment, if you've got the stomach to watch the news, and um, you will no doubt have seen that we have lots of floods 
and in the last couple of weeks and we've just you know it's today's the first day the sun shined here for probably 10 days we've had a lot of rain so the weather can be quite extreme so this week it's been floods last year it was bushfires and we weren't able to breathe so the only flip side of the bushfires we all had masks when coronavirus started we all already had the masks because you couldn't actually go outside for a few weeks without without the mask because of the smoke um on the flip uh, we've also quite excitingly got a mouse plague at the moment as well but the least i know about that the better it's still out in the bush at the moment but apparently it's getting closer to the cities um having said that we have beautiful wildlife the the area like the country is absolutely stunning um and one of the good things about being in property because the property market um is reasonably small everybody kind of knows each other but everybody meets in different places so i have traveled to for work um i've traveled to darwin i've been to alice springs i've been to perth and adelaide and all of these amazing places i've been to hamilton island which is this island in queensland all for work and so there's some really good opportunities to to get out and about um even even from a work perspective um some of the downsides of that living here um, is that it's not that close <laughs> to anywhere else. So you can't just pop to Europe for the weekend. You can't even pop home and see your mum and dad for the weekend at the moment. You can't even go back for um, three weeks to go and see your parents for the weekend. So you are quite um, remote, um, but you can, what a lot of people do is they pop to Bali for the weekend, which is something that is a bit harder to do from the UK. Um, and I think one of the other things about Australia is, um, the the way that the community and um, the government have responded to coronavirus whilst it felt very draconian at the beginning I think we're all really glad of the, the the very hard lockdowns that we had very early on and the borders closing because whilst it's terrible that we can't go and see family and things like that we can move around very freely here our stadiums are full our, our economy is back and up and running and and um and you know we're, we're starting to see massive transactions our industrial market is going through the roof we've got the biggest transaction we'll have seen for oh, many many if maybe possibly ever is going on at the moment there's a portfolio of 43 um uh, industrial assets on the market with premium grade tenants in lo like logistics type ten the tenants and that's just um, that will be a $4 billion um, transaction which will be huge for us so there's lots of opportunities out here um, and and that's a really nice thing about it is that because there's a lot of people um, from all around the world that work here, a lot of the skills that we have in the UK are really highly regarded and things like the RICS qualification is really highly regarded as well. I've probably just waffled for way too long, so I'll stop. Sorry. Not at all. Nicola, that was fascinating. Thank you ever so much. Really appreciate that. Um, uh, we'll, we'll pass on to Andy in a moment, um, but I just want to say that I am now, just to reassure you that you are younger than me, I was a year ahead of you in the uh, VOA sponsored course on PVM, so there we go, so but I got I got as far as, I got as far as Bangor in North Wales with the VOA, and you've got as far as Brisbane, so I think you win that one, that's pretty <laughs> neat, so that's kind of cool, and it's just, also, it's just also occurred to me that Barry and I started at Sheffield Hallam University in the same week, said so that I was a tutor, that's my first week here when he was a student, so now we go. So I'm going to pass on to Andy because I'm sure we've got no connections whatsoever, my friend. But um, without further ado, thank you for joining us and over to Paris. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Uh, can you hear me? Absolutely. Yes, Excellent. OK, so um, my journey in 15 minutes um, has been a multicultural one, like pretty much all the presenters today. And I'm guessing a lot of the students, too. So my parents are Australians from Sydney. I was educated in the UK. I've worked in Germany for five years and now in France for the last 26. So along the way, I've accumulated three passports, uh, an Australian, a British and a French. And these days that sort of optionality is quite good to have. Uh, my family, um, I'm speaking to you from my home in a town called Maison Lafitte, which is very beautiful, just outside Paris. Um, I live here with my wife, who, by the way, is also RICS trained. We have three boys who are student age. They're 24, 
22 and 18. Uh, they're all completely bilingual and bicultural and they're finding their way in the world. Um, my education for the journey, um, I went to a grammar school in the UK, uh, in Watford. And thereafter, I went to do a language degree at Oxford University in the mid 80s. Uh, but of course, languages at Oxford really means literature. So I majored in German literature, French literature. My specialist subject was medieval high German literature. So the crossover between that and commercial real estate is slightly limited. But if you like, what I'm saying is that I came at it through a path less traveled. And I, I joined uh, real estate as what's called a non-cognate, uh, sort of a euphemism that means that you know nothing at all. So that is unlike Sheffield Hallam students, I'm aware. So I ended up doing, to complete my education, I ended up doing RICS qualification in my spare time uh, by correspondence course. And that was something that I actually completely underestimated the degree of difficulty doing a day job and then studying after at night uh, was every bit as hard as an Oxford University degree ever knew how to be. So these are the main milestones in my education. My professional milestones, I began work, guess what, also in a crash. Uh, 1989 in September in the UK was just beginning to come off the top. And as I started work, interest rates went to 15%. Think of that, 15% was the base rate. And that caused a knee jerk reaction in the market and things started piling down and were accelerated in the Gulf War in August 1990. So my large intake of students, we were 49 at a company called Weatherall Green and Smith. So today part of BMP Paribas. Weatheralls uh, took on huge numbers of graduates at the time. So of the 49 of us, I think 14 got jobs post training. Uh, and it's, this is fascinating, listening to Barry, listening to Nicola about the effect that training in a crash has had. So the way I got out of the worst of that was by speaking languages. So I had trained to learn German and French. I could do that. I knew the square root of nothing about real estate, although I was learning in my spare time. But I managed to sidestep the worst of the crash by going to work in Germany around about the time of the Gulf War. And there I was useful. I had a, I had a sense of purpose. I was doing more than just doing the photocopying, which was pretty gruesome. So I found a sense of purpose in Germany and a sense of professional purpose because Real estate was never really my vocation, but when I got to work in Berlin, a city where everything was happening you know, from a totally clean page, remember the wall had just gone down when I arrived there, the built environment, I, I finally found a, a passion for that. So that was terrific. A uh, period of time, I was only there for about three years, but feel like I got about 10 years of experience in that three and such an intense moment that I've ended, ended up writing a book about it called A Thousand Days in Berlin, which you will find on Amazon. So um, that book was published about three years ago, but it's like my fourth child. I've got three boys in a book, but the Berlin moment was very, very powerful in my professional life and my personal life. Um, other milestones then in my professional life. I moved to Paris in January 1995, around about the moment that the Eurostar started running. 
an important milestone because that very link to the UK has made France much more multicultural. And when I say France, I'm actually meaning Paris. Previously, French waiters, famously rude, would only ever speak French. And if you didn't, too bad. These days, um, French waiters have probably worked in Starbucks in Putney. So it has been a period of osmosis of language and culture between Paris and London, which was catalyzed by that piece of infrastructure. So what have I done? Two, two main themes. One of them uh, for a small company, uh, which I founded, uh, was an entrepreneur. And I set up a business called The Retail Consulting Group. And the name gives you a clue as to what we did. Uh, that lasted eight years, and these, this was in the golden days of retail, um, before technology started eating its lunch. Retail was the sector to be in as an investor at the time, shopping centers, then high streets, then retail parks. And this was a fantastic period of time from 1996 to 2004. In 2004, I joined LaSalle Investment Management, a big global company. So I went from a very small company in which I was a part owner to a very large institution. And at LaSalle, uh, I was 12 years based out of Paris and running the European business. And these were also tremendous days. Um, I did a timeout, which is sabbatical between LaSalle and Europa Capital, where I am now. Uh, Time Out was just a golden period in which I wrote my book and did many other personal things that were very valuable. Traveled Nicola to New Zealand, where my brother lives. And um, this was just a golden period of time in my life. But after 18 months of sabbatical, three years ago, I joined Europa Capital, who are big supporters of Sheffield Hallam. And Europa are a pan-European investment manager, 75% owned by a giant Japanese institution, Mitsubishi Estates. Um, we are both an institution and in some ways a small business, you know, the entrepreneurial, uh, I own a small piece of the business. Um, to the question, Paris, what's it like? Since 1995, the city has really changed, but not dramatically. Physically, it hasn't changed that much, honestly. It's still beautiful. It's still built over 22 meters high. And the changes of London have not happened in Paris. So optically in those same years, the Olympic games and everything has brought to London a genuine global aspect and the buildings themselves are very, very different. Not so much in Paris. Uh, the real estate business here is very transparent. I think Nicola mentioned that one. And we are high up on transparency indexes, which is surprising to people from afar uh, who would have thought perhaps that Germany was the well-organized transparent market. In fact, it's France because a huge impetus here was given by the American investors in the mid 90s who arrived en masse. We've got exciting stuff happening shortly. We've got the Olympic Games coming in 2024. Uh, well, probably 2024. These Olympic themes seem to move around a bit at the moment. It might end up being 25, but I'm confident we're gonna get them. Uh, we're gonna have people here and that will be a wonderful moment. So there's a huge infrastructure program going on in Paris at the moment called Le Grand Paris. And that will double the amount of metros, metro lines that we have today, the amount of track. 68 new metro stations being built under our feet at the minute. So naturally, 
real estate handbook, infrastructure underpins real estate success. So we've got a lot of that new infrastructure happening. And with that, all sorts of exciting stuff. Lastly, my day job. Um, Barry's nice slide about you know, what are you doing a regular day. Uh, my, my main day job is growing a pan-European core plus investment fund uh, seeded by my parent company, Mitsubishi. Uh, we've now attracted some other investors, both from Asia and from Europe. We have currently 14 buildings in the fund. Um, the target is open end um, by definition. Um, we're looking forward to doing a lot more with that. I sit, very last of all, I sit in a beautiful little office just off the Champs Elysees, uh, which of all the five places I've ever worked in my 26 years here is my very favorite. Um, right now it's a little quiet and I'm not there, obviously I'm at home. I do get in once a week, and um, that is my life, Tony. Thank you ever so much for that. That is um, purely fascinating, Andy. I'm. I must admit, my my mind was um, kind of. Um, wondering to how fantastic everybody's life is um, in terms of, of all the greatness and, and the contribution that people are making. Um, and and before we carry on, I have got a couple of questions in the chat, if that's OK, that I'd like to probably ask to all uh, three members in, in turn. And, and I'm going to um, form a sort of a hybrid. Um, the, the first the first one is um, and I'll I'll we'll go uh, if we don't mind came in the same order. We'll go Barry, Nicola, and then Andy. Um, the first one is about you and your personal characteristics. So please don't be modest. So what what is it about you in terms of your personal characteristic that you think that has helped you in your careers to get where you are and to be the successes that you've been so far? So uh, and to um, to Barry first, please. Um. I think I think I'm a pretty persistent person. Um, just going back to when I um, you know, graduated in 2010, um, I do remember. Uh, in fact, I should have been revising for my exams, but I was bored when I started um, sort of call calling, as it were. Um, I, I just started looking at loads of different programs to sort of visualise and inspire me about where I could potentially work. Um, it just so happened that I was a humble citizen by birth, so. I'm not a natural place to apply. And I just remember researching about a lot of companies. Um, and to, you know, to, you know, just to put a long story short, I think I must have sent out about over 100 emails and probably about 50 old school snail mail letters of all sort of first class stamps on to uh, firms all around South Yorkshire. But, you know, I applied to a lot of firms in Asia, and especially in Hong Kong. And I think finally, um, a few people to get back to me and I sort of, you know, put hold of them very, very tightly and just kept on calling them every week to give me like a, a, a place on the internet scheme. So I do think I am quite a persistent person. Um, I think that's quite needed in an agency. You can't really take no for an answer. So, um, yeah, I'm always sort of on the phone to the client just trying to make sure, <laughs> trying to get them to uh, buy my buildings. Uh, secondly, I think I'm quite... Um, I'm quite sociable. Is, is that a skill? <laughs> Probably not, but um, I think it definitely helps in my line of work. Um, I'm always out. I'm always sort of whining, dining people. Um, but I, I do think that for my own personal network and professional network as well. Uh, and I think as Nicola mentioned, you know, this um, industry, no matter your geography, uh, people always tend to know um, each other within their own respective industries. Um, and I think that does manage to help you grow uh, professionally as well. Those two, yeah. <laughs> Those are my two skills. <laughs> That's good. That's good. That's great. Nicola? I think one of them's one of them's going to be the same as Barry. I'm very sociable and I'm really interested in people. And I've always really enjoyed learning more about what people do. And the, when people see that you're genuinely interested in, genuinely interested in them, you end up, um, it ends up giving you opportunities as well. So um, certainly if I, if, if I was like the shy retiring type, I probably wouldn't have 
that picked up the phone and got my first job in Australia, but I also probably wouldn't have had the same opportunities to stay and probably wouldn't have met the people that I started my own business with. And, and, and so I think there's probably, um, there's probably a bit of that social, but also I, I guess a, a bit of, I don't know, sometimes I can't decide whether it's um, brave or naive. Um, I think there's sometimes like a very thin line between the two. So starting my own business when I'd only been in the country for two years, was remarkably brave and remarkably naive, but it just happened to work. Um, but that a lot of that came from that, um, having lots of conversations with people and finding out uh, what other people thought about what, what our ideas were and, and just testing those ideas a lot as well. Um, and, and I think just having the capacity to actually, if you, if you see something that's not quite working in a business, actually trying to do something about it and having ideas and being vocal about them has also given me lots of opportunities as well. Great, thank you. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, the people dimension is super important in real estate. Um, property is a contact sport. And therefore, right now, we're missing that more than the average professional. There was an interesting study, I think, last summer by um, States Gazette about mental health in the real estate industry. And I think we just crave contact. So property people are more prone to mental health issues than the average. That's kind of a, a negative spin on basically a very positive thing. Like Nicola, like Barry, I would say you know, my interest in people is what has led to some great successes along the way. Um, just be interested in other people is what it's about. So my USP is probably multiculturalism. So France, Germany, yeah, but also Australian heritage, UK. But I've worked in loads and loads of markets across Europe and uh, on, on a good day. Ah, here we are, here we are, here's the thing. Um, when I got into real estate, um, my dad, who was doctor, he had a star patient who was the head of Hammerson's at the time. Um, he, he wheeled me in there and the guy said one thing that's always stood, stuck with me, which is um, on its best days, real estate's like being paid to be a tourist. So I thought, hey, that's cool. I can do that. I can really do that. And it's still true. On its very best days, you know, we can go places that other professions can't go. We need to go places. So a combination of the people and the travel is um, what I would say. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm just conscious of time, so I'm going to ask you one more question in a minute, but there are some questions in the chat, which I might ask the speakers to have a look through the chat um, and then maybe respond directly, because there's some that are quite pertinent, if that's helpful, um, and we can bond that way. But the question I'd like to um, end with um, is just to um, turn, turn the clock back, folks, okay, um, to when you started and to think about um, you um, as a new young professional setting off on your careers. Um, there's, it's a double-headed question, which is really naughty of me. First of all is, what would you do differently? And what advice have you got for students today if they were following in your footsteps? So double-headed question, what would you do differently, please, compared to um, your path, if anything? That could be a short answer. But more importantly, what have you, what advice have you got for the for the next generation, please, uh, following in your footsteps? Okay, so same again, please, if that's all right. So, um, Barry. Um, what I would do differently, I'd say um, I'd probably take on more opportunities and take on more risk. Um, obviously, as a student, there's only so much you can do, right? But I think in terms of um, when you graduate and you're looking at opportunities and you know you're thinking, you know, should I stay in my hometown? Should I stay in Sheffield? Anywhere else? I think just combining your sort of um, two questions, Tony, I'd say, you know. Um, take the risks, but also my advice to my younger self or anybody else would probably just be have a little bit of naivety and stay foolish, just so you can try new things. And uh, you know, sometimes, you know, as much as you want to want to uh, forward plan things, 
life careers, jobs, etc. It may not turn out how you expect them to. So you know, don't close any doors even before you you know kind of walk through them. Just uh, you know, try and grab everything with both hands. Thank you very much, Nicola. Um, I think the, one of the things I would do differently is, um, this is going to sound a bit weird, but I would have left a couple of jobs a bit sooner. So I, especially when I had my own business, it was um, really for myself and for my own career and my own opportunities. I probably should have left that um, sooner, but because it was my baby and um, I felt a great deal of loyalty to the people I was working with, I probably hung around a couple of years longer than I should have. Um, and they would have all gone on fine without me, but it was really, really hard. And, 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 and I didn't, I didn't probably get out when I should. And I think that's a really, I don't think, and, and sort of the, the advice I've given people is that very rarely will you regret leaving somewhere, but you will definitely regret staying sometimes. <laughs> um, so that's probably something to just bear in mind. Um, but I think, I think the, the best advice I have is just to always be curious. And if you're just always interested in what's going on and what everybody else is doing and what opportunities are out there and are generally open to new things, then that's the best advice I can give. That's perfect. Thank you very much. Um, Andy, please. I'm going to do it the other way around and do the advice first. Um, I think curious is a, good, is a good way of looking at it, making it be useful. Make yourself useful, and if you are useful, then you will find a sense of purpose. Um, don't hesitate to take the path less traveled, is another. That's kind of Barry's point about risk. Um, I've found my own way through paths really much less traveled. So when I came to work on the continent around about the Gulf War, number one, it was like going to deepest, darkest Albania today to set up as a, as a chartered surveyor. This was, this was risky, but the reward was, was tremendous. Um, so, I mean, do, what would I do differently? I think the only moments that I've languished have been the moments where I've not been useful. And generally that's worked out okay, but I think I'm coming back to Nicola's point about don't hesitate to uh, to move on. Great. Thank you ever so much. Right, um, right on time, we will close it there. And I will say thank you very much to our first three panellists. I will just end on the note to say, um, not only have you been interesting, informative, and we've thoroughly had you, enjoyed having you with you, but Andy, you've also sold a book. Okay, so um, that's the, the, there we are. I'll just let you in on that one. So I think we'll all be getting that. <laughs> so that's brilliant. So thank you. Um, without further ado, I'm going to um, hand over to Louise for the second half. And, um, and I say, if people can keep engaging with the chat, that would be fantastic. I say there are questions in there that we've not had the opportunity to answer yet live, but I say if we can respond sort of right in the chat that'd be great um and um thank you very much louise floor is yours thanks tony that's great and thank you our panelists uh, so far it's really interesting it's it's quite interesting when you say what would you do differently and what would your advice because i think when you're a, a, an agent surveyor like myself you can think of 101 things you might have done differently and the mm -hmm. advice that you would have gone for and um, it's quite interesting to, to, to think about where people's careers have gone and, and how they've got there, which has been excellent. Um, and it does make you think a little bit about your own as well, about maybe moving on quicker than you should have done. Um, so an excellent response. So thank you very much. Um, so the rest of this morning, I have got uh, two panelists. My first one is Sham from uh, the, actually located in Dubai from Work Panda. And uh, my next panelist is our very well known, if you're from SHU, uh, is Began, who's going to talk to us a little bit about the alternative about working in the UK. Um, but I'm gonna, first going to hand over to Sham and I'm, I'm going to ask him first and foremost, what is on your mug? Oh, I'm actually a Liverpool football club supporter. You know, so I, I always do this because it stimulates conversation. Absolutely. You're a man of taste and vision. We. So, <laughs> I'm going to hand over to you and you can tell us all about, about Work Panda and about your, your process of where you've got today. Thank you very much. Perfect. I'd just like to say I wish 
I had the panelists speaking at my university almost 10 years ago, because the advice that we've just received has been phenomenal. Um, and it's, it's funny how we don't know each other. This is the first time that um, I've heard from each of the speakers, but we've got so much in common. Um, I actually was brought up very close to Watford, uh, spent three years of my life working at PC World next to the Harlequin. Um, I'm also a business owner, similar to Nicola. And like Barry, I also did an internship uh, at Savills. Um, I'm based in sunny Dubai. It's uh, 35 degrees. And hopefully today I'm going to give you a different spin onto careers within real estate and in construction and the wider built in uh, environment across several geographies. Um, so here we go. And, you know, keep on asking questions. It's so important at this stage of your life with the panelists that we've got in this um, arena to ask as many questions as possible. So feel free and there is no such thing as a silly question. And that's something that I've learned over the last eight or nine years and, and even more. So if I can make this work. So like most of the other panelists, um, my career has just been a, an amazing adventure but a bit of a mess as well at the same time. Um, going back to 2011, uh, you know, graduating on the back end of, of a recession, I didn't really know where I stood. You know, I graduated from a Russell Group University, um, never really did any internships prior to that during my academia. Um, uh, studied geography, so as, as Andy was talking about, I, I, I qualify as a non-cognate. Someone who is not accredited by the RICS or CIOB or MAPM or, or anyone. So graduating at a time where there was, you know, um, turmoil in the market, where I had no control over any macroeconomic factors, I was basically by myself. And knowing or, or coming from a family background who've been in real estate, um, there was so much advice given to me, but with so many different people giving me so much different advice, my mind was not here and it wasn't there. So I, I, I started um, a distance learning course at the College of Estate Management and the College of Estate Management do part-time distance learning courses. So during that time, I thought to myself, I need to get some practical experience within the industry as well as build my academic knowledge. They both go hand in hand. So enrolling on, on, a, on a distance learning course gave me the opportunity to also apply for opportunities. So you can see, I spent you know, a considerable amount of time applying um, you know, 100 different resumes. So everyone needs to remember that you know, having one resume and dishing it out to different organizations is not the right way of doing things. If you're applying for the likes of Knight Frank, and you're applying to maybe a construction or consultancy firm like E.T. Harris, you're applying for an organization who do two different things. So you have to tailor your resume. And unfortunately, at that stage of my life, I just didn't know. I was naive. No one had told me this. So I spent a good part of two years out of work doing voluntary work experience, which I, at this stage of my life, can say it built the foundations of who I am right now both my personality as well as my resume. So I always say this to people, your network is your net worth. Go out, speak to people, utilize um, your mobile phone, right? Everyone has LinkedIn on their mobile phone. Everyone has Instagram, everyone has Twitter, everyone has medium.com. Everyone has all of these different tools that maybe 20 years ago, people didn't have. It was mostly face-to-face -face networking, but Having social media has changed the way we approach careers, jobs, opportunities, network. And that's what I leveraged. I leveraged social media as a way to get into all of these organizations. Say it's the back door or say I was smart. I got there, right? How many people are applying for graduate roles right now? I'm saying 7,000 people. Savills get 7,000 applicants from all around the world. For example, in London or in, in major cities like Birmingham, Manchester, and also Sheffield, you are competing on a global marketplace. How do you get seen? 
And now we're moving into a environment where personal branding and getting your name and acknowledgements uh, and all your achievements out there is the way to go. And this is what I learned nine years ago. And this is what everyone should be considering right now in order to separate yourself from the competition and associating yourself with brands like Sheffield Hallam University, their alumni and large organizations will put you one step ahead of the competition. So again, Knight Frank, I did commercial uh, research um, and it was a boring job, I'm not going to lie, but having Knight Frank and having um, the network that Knight Frank you know, have and speaking to their partners over a coffee really stimulated the knowledge I needed to make decisions in the future. Um, and again, having that network and then adding them on LinkedIn was a great way to cultivate those relationships over the course of my, um, you know, tenure of my career. I actually messaged Paddy Dring, who's one of the head partners at Knight Frank in Baker Street. And he goes, hey, I remember you. You're the guy who kept on asking me questions. And I was like, wow, Paddy, that was nine years ago. Right. So it makes a difference. Through Knight Frank on my resume, I then got onto Allsops and then onto Savills and then EC Harris. And then that's really where my um, career had then, you know, you know, built momentum. I always continued asking questions and I was deservant of the opportunity. And the clever thing that, that you see within two years, surveying the built environment is such a diverse career that if you don't spend two or three weeks doing the job, you might be manipulated by just reading a job description. Go out and do it. Do it for your local high street surveying firm or go out and work with a big brand, but just get an insight to what a career may look like. And that's what I did. So commercial research at Knight Frank. I did auctions at uh, all sorts. I did planning and development at Savills. I did building surveying at EC Harris. I did project management at EC Harris. I did quantity surveying at EC Harris. I did commercial and cost management at EC Harris. I did facilities management. All of a sudden, in the space of two years, yes, all my friends who are working at JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs were all driving BMWs. But what I was building, the knowledge that I was building, developed the latter part of my career. And this is very important. If you can understand the journey ahead, you know, you will then pick up momentum. It's okay to fail. And I did fail by sending 100 resumes, but that learning curve in two years is what, you know, led me to opportunities, work and live abroad, you know, work with Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi, et cetera, et cetera. So spend time cultivating the knowledge, understanding exactly what you want. If it takes two years, that's great. If it takes three, that's fine. But build a strong foundation. If you resonate that to construction or the built environment, the Burj Khalifa was built on piles, which are, you know, a mile long, right? And it took ages before they built the substructure, the superstructure, sorry. Do the same thing. A job is one off. A career is with you for life, in which case build a strong foundation. So coming on after my graduate scheme, you know, I, 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 I kind of understood, you know, what the opportunities were within the built environment, you know, where my passion lies. Passion is so important when it comes to careers. And I think the panelists have, all, have also been advocate of getting their passion and really releasing that energy in to get to where they um, are today, whether it is traveling or writing a book or, you know, taking advantage of, you know, working in Asia or, or the like. Um, so I think we all resonate with that. So being a young, naive uh, extrovert, um, I took well advantage of working for a global organization. At that time, Arcadis had leadership programs, they had exchange programs, they had all of these different um, opportunities um, that I took advantage of. Whilst the other graduates were getting drunk in King's Cross and, and going to all these nice places, I spent time actually networking and getting involved in all of the things um, that most of the graduates didn't you know, want to uh, participate in. So I did a stint in Hong Kong with them. I did a stint in Shanghai. Um, I was part of their program called Global Shapers, which is the 100 best leaders out of 27,000 people around the world. And you, you partner up with a partner from a different office around the world uh, and they reverse mentor you or, or we would reverse mentor them and they mentored us in how to become a good leader. And that's really where I got that flavor of working abroad. You know, um, you know, Barry will talk about the jockey club, you know, everyone going out on Wednesday nights, 
it's a huge expat environment, drinking, flaming uh, Zambukas, you know, working hard, playing hard, everyone wearing their suits, pocket squares, Burberry umbrellas. I loved all of that. I just loved it. I was like, wow, this is really like the Wolf of Wall Street. I want to do that. So going on to that exchange program, coming back, I handed in my notice and saying, guys, I loved working in affordable housing, but I'm getting to Hong Kong right now to, you know, sip on my flaming Zambukas and work with, you know, a, a different organization there. And they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, you need to steady on. You're still a graduate. You, you've got a lot to learn. And uh, I said, no, I'm adamant. I'm going to fly to Hong Kong. I don't have a job. I'm going to go work there. And they were like, no, have you thought about taking your career to the Middle East? And I was like, whoa, that's something I haven't considered. And I don't think my parents would be happy going into the Middle East just because of the news and what you hear about the Middle East and boom, 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 shotguns, AK-47s. And I was like, great. Um, I was living with my parents. I was like, I can't be doing this. I couldn't afford actually renting or buying a place. So I thought, well, hey, Heathrow, here we come. Emirates Airlines, uh, let's go. And um, I'd never visited the Middle East. And I thought I'll do six months and I'll come back and then I'll make some good money tax free and then start my life in, in, in London again. And it didn't work that way because I loved it. And I was learning loads and I was with expats and the, the energy, the heat. Um, I had money in my pocket now. I'd never had money because I was paying off my student debt in London. And, you know, I just it's, it's a very expensive place, um, London. So I couldn't live the life. So coming into the Middle East, it was just kind of like an opportunity for me to go all out. Um, and here is where I diversified my knowledge. So I'm building my network through social media, through LinkedIn, through doing, you know, going to Hong Kong, going to Shanghai, as well as building my social network globally. So I'm creating a global brand now, from a regional brand to a global brand. So I worked with Arcadis, um, worked on shopping malls, and I'll show you some photos of the, shop, of the shopping malls. I worked on some legacy projects, master planning, and so on and so forth. So now this is really where I start building competence, right? Um, and this is very important when it comes to getting your qualifications. So whilst I built competence in the UK and UAE, I then start thinking about qualifications and where is my career now growing, right? I kept on watering the seeds about what I know in my network. Then I start thinking, where can this career then take me? So um, I started learning about the APM, which is the Association of Project Management. My background is in project management. I got my qualifications. I then moved on to, you know, get my qualifications in CIOB and, and the RICS. Happy to answer any questions on, on, on those. But as my career grew, as my, as my network started growing, Faithful and Gold called me up and saying, hey, Sham, you know, we've got a fantastic opportunity in shopping malls. Uh, sorry, not shopping malls, in healthcare. Uh, King's College London want to expand their, um, you know, brand in the Middle East. We know that you've got the experience, you're young, you're vibrant, you know, you're, um, you know, you, you, you've got good qualifications, you've got a good resume. And I was like, hey, guys, like I have no healthcare experience. I've never worked on a healthcare facility. And, you know, deep down, I thought to myself, wow, this is a new challenge. Having King's College on my resume would actually be tremendous, right? Especially in a market, an emerging market um, where healthcare is so prevalent. I was like, damn, I'm just going to do it. Remember, guys, I had no I had no experience in healthcare, but I did have the skills, right? And the skills underpin the opportunity uh, for me to then say, actually, guys, I'm down. Let's go. Let's work. And then I was born to Faithful and Gold. Then my my experience, you know, um, spiraled, and I was doing healthcare. Worked with some fantastic brands, you know, Perkin and Wills, a Chicago-based architect firm. Um, I've worked with so many other different uh, brands out there. And then come five or six years into my career, I got a call from the Public Investment Fund. Um, and if you're not in region, you probably don't know much about them, but they're one of the biggest sovereign wealth funds in the world. Um, they have blank check. They are basically, um, Saudi Arabia are basically transforming their economy from oil to hospitality, tech, um, technology, etc. And these guys are um, buying up a lot of things like, you know, they're on the stock market, um, they're buying organizations, plants in Europe, um, offsite manufacturing plants, modular construction plants. 
these guys are spending and that's really where um, most of the big business in construction and potentially real estate will be, in my opinion, um, over the over the next year. So they called me up saying, you, we think that you've got some potential to help us structure this business. Come in. And I'm like, I just started shaving. Like I just got hair on my chin. I'm not going to Saudi Arabia. I've, I've heard that they shoot people. I'm not going there. And fortunate enough for me, because of my network that I grew, I made a couple of phone calls and said, hey, Claudia, we used to work together at Arcadis. Um, you're in Saudi. What's it like? And she was like, look, Saudi is going to be massive in three years. Come here, get the work done, sacrifice your, your drinking life that you've got in Dubai and your, and, your, and, your, and your travels to Vegas. Come here, do two years. You won't regret it. And I trusted Claudia. I'd worked with her for four years, developing, you know, projects with Arcadis and the like. And I was like, let's do it. So again, made a very bold but informed decision about my future. My parents were like, we're going to disown you now. Like, if you go to Saudi Arabia, you're not going to come back. There's a war going on. You're not going to this, you know, they're fighting. There's, there's missiles flying across where the Red Sea is. You're not going. There's a massive, you know, hoo-ha going on. And I was like, this is pretty exciting. I've seen war dogs. I'm going to go straight into the middle and get this stuff done. And that's what I did. And it's nothing, nothing like the TV, the movies, CNN, NBC. It's nothing like you guys have imagined. It, I've traveled extensively around the world. I've been to Mexico. I've done diving. I've been to all the party places around the world. And Saudi Arabia is the most beautiful place the most untouched, pristine, natural environment I have ever been to. It's phenomenal. Um, and there, that's really where I started growing my network, meeting and uh, meeting some serious big hitters in the industry. I've met CEOs from Atkins. I've met CEOs from all the big places. And I kept on pinching myself like I'm a 29 year old boy who doesn't you know, know much about what's going on. I've only been in the industry for nine years. And I met all these big people and I was like, wow, this is so crazy. Like if I didn't make this move, then I wouldn't be in front of these people. And they actually spoke to me and listened to me like I was deserving of the conversation. When back when I was at Arcadis, I was just under a hierarchy of SPMs and associate directors. And I was drowning because there were so many good people, but there I was on the front line. So you know, looking at my career right now, it's just been epic to see that if I didn't speak out, but also not listened and also believed in myself and my and my network, that I wouldn't have gone to actually do some of the things that um, I would have done in short succession. You know, most of the speakers have got 15, 20 years experience. I've done this in seven, right? And that's not to say that I'm rolling sixes and, and taking shortcuts, right? But I'm taking the opportunities and not really, um, you know, um, not really, you know, saying no or being fearful. I'm taking it as it comes and learning. And that's so important as a young person that you learn, you listen, you adapt, you speak to your network, and then you basically take it forward. So coming now, and I'll speak more about this, I left the corporate world because my passion changed. I was passionate about construction, real estate, engineering, but now with the digital economy coming to light and prop tech, real estate tech, construction tech is going to be the forefront of our world now and, um, and more so in five years time. I'm sure everyone's learning about Bitcoin. And I was like, that currency is never going to fly. We're never going to use Bitcoin. But then Elon Musk comes, boom, all of a sudden. So when you relate this back to construction, the digital revolution is coming. I'm just five years ahead of you, right? And people are like, no, 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 we're never going to use that. Guys, it's happening. And this is what we've done with Work Thunder. So this is a general introduction to who I am, what I've done and the future. And then over the next five or 10 minutes, I'm just going to go through um, some more information about um, what I've done and, and, and the support network that we have created on a global scale. So I've, I've been fortunate enough to work with Norman Foster's team um, in London. Um, they're doing a lot of work in Saudi Arabia for the Public Investment Fund. So they're building uh, the state-of-the-art airport um, you need to know that I've worked on pretty much every asset, whether it's a shopping mall or overwater villas or beach villas or uh, luxury airports or luxury uh, hospitality venues. I've done Section 106 in the UK with uh, like Notting Hill Housing Trust, LNQ. Uh, I've done a lot. 
Um, and, you know, working with these brands and working on these projects has really built, you know, everything that, that, that I know today. So, you know, um, airport projects, um, Kengo Kuma, top five architects in the world. Um, you know, he's a super, super amazing, intelligent, clever person based in Japan. Um, he's doing a lot of work with um, sustainable construction. If you look at his portfolio, it's all to do with like timber or, or renewable um, energy uh, and, and the like. He's doing a lot of work with the Red Sea Development Company. Uh, Majid Al Fatame, um, again, you know, powerhouse in, in, in building, uh, not only just shopping malls, but residential units uh, and the like. Uh, they're currently building a uh, mall of Saudi Arabia, which will be the biggest mall, which will dwarf uh, the Dubai mall, if you've ever been here, and then King's College. These are just some of the prominent um, uh, buildings uh, and structures that I've worked on. I've also done uh, master development on island uh, structures, master planning, and, and, and the like. But these are some of the projects that I am I'm, uh, proud to be uh, working uh, with and associated with. So let's say taking your career abroad. So um, here at WorkPanda, we're concentrating on this small and medium enterprises. Yes, we know Jacobs and CBRE and Savile are great brands to work for. But where I personally feel where the market is underserved is the SMEs, the organizations who want to grow and develop their business, but don't have the resources, the talent managers, the hiring managers, the marketing on LinkedIn in order to get people like yourself into work. Um, a lot of people say, oh, but there's no jobs. Guys, if you had my knowledge and my brain, there are so many opportunities out there at the moment that people on the employer side don't know how to brand those opportunities or, 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 or know where the candidates are. It's normally just a flick of a button that goes on LinkedIn, but LinkedIn has 7% of the global population, right? That's 700 million people are on LinkedIn. If you went to find yourself right now, you wouldn't even be able to find yourself, let alone these opportunities. And unfortunately, Candidates don't know how to brand themselves. Uh, I get 36 page resumes. I get people waffling on about how they worked, did this, but it doesn't align with what I want as an employer. So what we're doing is we're creating that marketplace via technology. So going back to the slide, right? There's three growth markets that we have identified. Um, GTC, because that's where I live. The UK, because that's where I was born and I have a very vast network there. And North America, just because that's really where our business will go from a, a million dollar company to a billion dollar company. And in terms of construction spend, in my opinion, these are the three growth markets that we believe we can penetrate. GTC because of PIF and the expenditure um, that they want, both on infrastructure and building spend. Uh, the UK, they've got many infrastructure programs going on with HS2. We're speaking to HS2 right now. HS2 want to employ 30,000 people in the space of five years. Using recruiters and using LinkedIn will not even get them close to getting 10% of that. Using a solution like ours, we can quickly vet, assess, and get people into the door. And then North America, again, you know, trillion dollar industry, multi trillion dollar industry, and growing. Um, huge amounts of uh, infrastructure spend uh, and, 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 and capital spend on, on building projects, whether it's stadiums or, you know, regeneration projects or master planning. Yes, it's a very uh, mature market, but in pockets of America, there is so much work, particularly in Texas and California. Um, and so this is where we think their opportunity is. That's not to say that India and Africa, huge potentials, but for Work Panda, these markets are so volatile um, and um, uh, immature, uh, we wouldn't even know where to start. Um, Australia, there's something that we're considering and we're trying to forge uh, partners and relationships there, but uh, I, I personally uh, don't understand the market enough in order to uh, make a decision on that market. Uh, Europe, uh, language barrier and, and South America, we don't really know much. So based on our research from Statista, this is where we personally feel and what we're focusing over the next couple of years. I'm going to quickly run through. Um, okay, so lifestyle. So lifestyle and, and my life in Dubai. So honestly, I've spent my, uh, most of my adult life in the Middle East. Um, I came here in 2014. I was only 23, 24, um, went in blindly. But honestly, I don't want to leave. Um, whether it is Friday night brunches or going out or eating at restaurants or, you know, doing a zip line across mountainous, you know, terrains or whether it's, you know, um, taking in you know, a canoe out somewhere or traveling, road trip, 
such an excellent lifestyle, such a good work-life balance, which everyone who has, you know, um, been in their career will say it's so important. Don't burn out, guys, right? Yes, a lot of people say, wow, but you've done so much. Aren't you burnt out? Guys, this is just the beginning, right? Travel. Uh, I love traveling. I love flying with Emirates Airlines. I've, I've traveled everywhere. Unfortunately, I have not been to Australia, but that's, that's somewhere I do want to visit. My Bali flights got canceled because of COVID. Um, I've traveled everywhere. I've been to like Peru. I've been to um, loads of places. Uh, I've, been to, I've done the Route 101 through California. Um, I've been to Canada about five times. And having a hub, being in the center of the world um, has allowed me access to places that if I was in the UK, I would never even think of, right? Um, and that's been amazing. Like Salala in Oman, like I never even heard of Oman before. Now I've done like three trips there. I've even driven to Oman. So it's just amazing. Like when you move city, the opportunity of travel. Um, again, opportunity. Um, you know, what I've learned is that living in the UK is super competitive. Everyone is well-educated. Um, you know, the competition is fierce. Everyone wants to work in Manchester and London, not just people living in the UK, but people coming from abroad. London is the place to be. And being in a very competitive environment, how do you stand out, right? Difficult. So what I said was, damn, it's going to go to an emerging market where, you know, my, my, my language skills, my interpersonal skills, my knowledge, my experience, my drive, my passion will take me and make me stick out. And that's what I did, right? And if you say to myself, would I be the same person if I stayed in London? Probably not, because it's just that damn competitive. Uh, and then the last thing is diversity, right? Diversity is key. You know, Dubai is home to so many different nationalities, whether they're from the GCC region, Levant, um, you know, Indian, Filipino, uh, expat community, American, or, or the like. You're meeting so many different people. So this is really why I love living here in the Middle East. And also, if my mom wants to visit, six hours. If I want to go back, it's six hours. So I'm still close to home, which is very, very important. Um, that's that. Uh, considerations. So the Middle East, I'm sure you guys are aware, if you, if you read the tabloid, it's a very different environment. So number one, it's culture. You're mixing West and East, some things which are... Um, you know, available or if, if it's acceptable, sorry, um, in, in the UK is not acceptable um, in the UAE. Uh, for example, and this goes in line with the law, is like drinking and consuming alcohol on the streets. Total no-go. Do not even think about, you know, uh, walking home drunk or walking to your hotel drunk. You'll, you'll be put in prison, right? Um, so don't, don't think about uh, doing that. Um, swearing, you know, it can be taken for blasphemy. So be very, very careful in terms of what you're saying, how you're saying it, make sure you're respectable, right? If they, but this is all common to any country that you go to. Don't expect to, you know, have your UK traditions and bring them into the Middle East because if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't want to be you. The climate, you know, right now it's great. It's highs of 35, lows of 32, fantastic, great to tan. Uh, I live probably about 15 minutes, 15 minutes away from the beach. Um, in summer, it gets hot. Um, and in winter, I can reach about 10 degrees. So for me, great climate. And my body has climatized. Um, job stability. You know, everyone is on a working visa or a visa of some sort. So if you're not, in, if you're not employed, then your, um, your duration in Dubai could come to an end. Uh, and that's across the GCC, not just Dubai. So it's a very transient city. The people who I met eight years ago or six years ago, sorry, have now gone and a new group of people have come in. So making friends, you're always continuously making friends, which I love and I also hate because, you know, you're always shedding a tear at the airport. Like, wow, I spent so long knowing you. Like, why are you leaving? Stay. But unfortunately, you know, when there's no work, you know, you have to go back to your home country or move on. A lot of people go on to New Zealand, Australia, or they go to, you know, South Africa or, or wherever else. Standard of living. Um, it's, it's very lucrative to get a tax-free um, salary. However, it's expensive. It's hidden taxes, right? If you want to buy a pint of beer, it's about 10 pounds, right? If you want to go buy clothes, there's a massive duty. So you have to be very, very vigilant that you have to gain tax-free, but things here are very, very expensive. And then, as I said, the strict law. So let's go back to you guys now. Everything's about you, right? And this is what everyone looks like right now. If you're an intern, placement student, graduate, you know, you've been, you know, uh, or you're in the process of graduating, this is what it looks like. Where's Wally? I'm sure everyone's seen this before, the comic book. Um, you're invisible, 
you're just invisible to the people that you need. Um, so this is what's going on around you. There's so many different things. There's people in work, people not in work, you've got your employers, wherever, but you're just a dot. Um, and how do you become invisible to the right people? And this is what Work Panda is all about, making the invisible visible. Uh, and we're only dedicated to the built environment. So we're not like LinkedIn or a recruitment firm. We're specifically for, for the people within the, the industry. If you think about where's Wally, he's right in the middle. So here's the problem. The problem is that you guys are spending a long time. And this is pre-COVID, by the way. It takes around nine weeks to get hired. And that's even if you're successful. Because, you know, as I said previously, each, each uh, organization is receiving 1,500 applications right whether these take you three hours to take or whether you're handing your cv whether you're you're going in for knight frank or cushman or bmp or or whoever else these guys are receiving so many applications you know most of you don't have one route to applying for jobs you will go on twitter linkedin facebook job boards monster indeed you'll go to traditional recruitment companies about 15 or 10 or 15 different ways to get employed and you're you're really relying on luck right, in order to get to where you want to be. And unfortunately, what we're trying to do is calculate that luck, Work Panda trying to calculate that luck and try to actually uh, match you rather than actually you just waiting near the phone and, and crying saying, I can't get a job, right? So accessibility, you're using too many different tools to get hired. 50% um, of applicants lose interest. Oh my God, the same applications. I used to just copy and paste. I'm not even going to deny that because... Asking the same questions is just laborious. Um, experience, 73% of candidates find job seeking um, uh, stressful. And if you were going to get your uh, uh, resume uh, completed by someone else, it's going to cost you around $95. And that's expensive. So what we've created is a free solution. It's a technology solution. So you can just sign up on your phone right now or through your tablet, your, your iPad or on your desktop. We improve the quality by using video interviewing uh, to qualify the right candidate. And we've got stage gate reviews in order for, you, for the employer to get to the right candidate. Uh, we do automated uh, profile passing. So instead of having a 30 page resume, we automatically pass through everyone's resume and categorize that to the five candidates that they want to see, not 1500. Um, we're a globalized solution. Currently, we're just focusing on GCC because there are so many people out of work right now, but we, we're doing some work in the UK right now as well, uh, but focusing on the GCC market. Um, curated matches, so we're using AI and machine learning as a way of learning every time. So if an employee is looking for valuation surveyors and it's across a, a, a program, then we can give you 10 of the similar resumes with a click of a button. Uh, and we do virtual learning. So virtual learning is to do with CPD, uh, giving you, um, you know, information and knowledge that you need at every stage of your career, tailored to you. So you're not reading about project management. If you're not a project manager, you're learning about things that you want to see. And everything now you do is personalized, including your Instagram, your Twitter, and everything else. If you're watching football and you're on ASOS, it will start selling you football shoes. And this is exactly what we're doing with careers. Um, I want to show you a quick video in terms of what it looks like, because I can't sit here and talk to you about how innovative we are if I don't actually show you. So here's a quick 30, 30 minute video just to show you. Um, it works. I don't know. There's no sound, unfortunately, but at least it gives you some insight. You probably missed all the, uh, there was actually some uh, Lord of the Rings type of music in the background, but unfortunately you didn't get to listen to it for some reason. 
But, you know, we've been helping people for around nine years. Uh, we've helped graduates into companies like CBRE. Tom used to work in the CBRE office in, uh, in London. He's now moved to Australia um, and we helped him make that decision. And now he's now moved to a different organization. Jamie has just become a chartered surveyor. Um, he is still at CBRE in London. Um, and he's enjoying his um, his time there as well. Um, what we say is, you know, we want to be, be your partner. We want to take your career to the next stage, right? And by and we've been working with these guys for five years, so we really want to take you to the next stage and really build a profile around you. So when you're looking for the next job, you call Work Planner straight away, and we can start tapping into how we can take you to the next stage of your career. Um, we've been in the press, we've done work for Ricks. I used to be on the UK board. Um, I used to be part of Ma Ricks Matrix. Everyone should join. I've done work for The Guardian, Property Week, Target Jobs, uh, Michael Page. We're working with pros prospects right now in the Middle East and hopefully uh, move it to the UK as well on that. Um, and this is my aspiration. As an entrepreneur in the industry, you know, Work Panda will be the leading marketplace used for hiring white collar professionals, which is most of you guys uh, in the built environment across all levels, roles and geographies. So it's a very ambitious task, uh, but no doubt that with the tenacity and the partners that we have, including Microsoft, who are a strategic partner for Work Panda, as well as Nvidia, who make all your chips for your laptop, as well as some other strategic partners, uh, we will be able to get there over the next five years. Um, and hopefully you and your friends and your colleagues and the baby boomers, Generation Y, Generation X, Generation Z, uh, will all be using Work Panda as a way of, um, you know, building their career, finding the next opportunity um, and taking their career and life to the next stage. So that's really from my side. I think I went over time. I really apologize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I apologise, but we got there in the end. We, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. That's um, extremely, extremely extensive. And, and to give us that, I'm quite envious, actually. I think it's my, my career sounds rubbish now in comparison, but uh, brilliant. So I'm going to pass over to B, um, who is our next speaker. And she's going to sort of give us the alternative, what it's like to come to the UK and to work in the UK and, and your career profile. So over to you, B. thanks. Thank you, Lou. Um, so good, well, good morning, good evening. Um, so it's almost 20 years ago uh, when I made the decision to come to UK to complete my final year degree study in construction. And I think it was quickly realized that being a QS is not really for me. I think we all talk about real estate property job is a lot about people, um, a lot about visiting places. That's kind of like my passion. So I did some research and then applied to study MSc property appraisal management, which was the same course as Tony and Nicola. And I wanted to be MRICS. I set myself up to say, I want to get chartered in the UK. I want to work in London. That was 20 odd years back, 20 years back, that was my dream. So it was challenging because I think by the time I complete my, almost complete my MSc, that's like 15, 16 years ago. I think the real estate industry back then is not as diverse as it is now. It was very challenging because I sent up a lot of resume, a lot of application and I think a lot of company I shouldn't really send it I should read it carefully they even say that if you require a work sponsor we don't sponsor work permit so do not apply so that's constantly rejections emails or a letter coming back and I thought it's like what am I going to do so I thought I paused for a while concentrate to finishing my master's degree and at that time our course took us to a field trip to Shanghai and there was like 30 of us, we landed in Shanghai and kind of thinking this like, well, I'm, I was always a quiet one in the class, um, the only international student, even though I, I met a lot of nice course mates and then we do teamwork and everything, but I kind of like conscious about my language skill and just kind of like not really drinking that much as well. So I didn't really join for like after class pub social so anyway, we were in Shanghai 
And then there it goes. My tutor came to me and said, B, do you speak Chinese? I said, yeah, come and help us out because we stood in front of the hotel, 30 of us with 12 hours flight from London and we're tired and the hotel refused to let us check in and there was communication problem. And from that moment onwards, throughout the seven days visit in Shanghai, I was becoming the main kind of like translator for the whole group from dealing with booking taxi, taking people, um, ordering food, everything. And during that week, we were very fortunate that we worked with the top five company. We were, we were spending our work time in the office with the directors. We go around to visit different directors to get some insight. And again, back then, unlike UK, Australia and France, data is not transparent. So we could be getting some information from DTZ saying this, Cushman will contradict the data. Um, but anyway, towards the end, after we've done our presentation, our team won, and to my surprise, I got three job offer. And naive and also very stubborn of me, I thought, no, I'm not ready to go to Shanghai because I haven't got my MRIs. Yes, I wanted to kind of achieve what I set out to do, to work in London to get on my MRIs. Yes. So I politely kind of like just turn it down and say, when I'm ready, I'm hoping that you're going to still have the door open for me, but thank you. Um, so I left with my peers, come back to UK, complete my degree, still kind of like struggle to get a job because I need a work permit to stay in the UK. So opportunity came, my tutor then say, hey, we know you, you want to work in the UK. In the meantime, do you want to work with us in the university, supporting the subject group? Um, and then feel free, whenever you get a job in the real estate, you can go, no commitment, but we we'll sponsor your visa for now. So I thought, great, I'll take it up. And then they were very supportive. And I think at the beginning, I think we had a summer and then they just say, it's okay. You don't have any teaching over the summer. Just take your time. If you want to do work experience, go ahead and do it. So I took the opportunity, um, got a lot of placement experience, worked for the council. And I think one of my longer placement was with Brynwood in Leeds. So from kind of doing one month solid with them, then they say, um, do you want to carry on? Just come in on a weekly basis once a week. So I, comp I continue to do that. And I think it came to, they wanted to offer me a job. I applied, got it, but there it goes, the recession hit. And then they rang me up and say, we have to withdraw your offer. We have to withdraw your application for the work permit. Here is one month salary. Sorry, we couldn't proceed with your employment because we decided not to take on any placement and graduates. So again, it's like, oh my God, why is it? keep on happening to me. Why didn't I just accept the job in, in Shanghai? So I thought, right, okay, I concentrate back on the job at university. And again, my tutor back then and colleague, they started to say, why don't you start to do some teaching? So I thought, right, okay, I can do that. And I started to teach evaluation. And I think um, unlucky Barry, you were one of my kind of like first group of students that I taught. Um, I slowly grow into my job and a lot more opportunity happen because I'm open to kind of visit places very because I came from Malaysia it's multicultural speak several language and I think a tutor just kind of like, I have the can do mentality I have a lot of initiative that I want to offer back to the university and student and staff so they just let me free reign whatever you want to do go ahead and do it so create a careers fair, um, set up student society, and then kind of thinking about what else student can do. And I also involved in an RICA supported European real estate challenge. So we have every year we took six of our students to Berlin um, and we have another 10 different European countries, uh, university joining in. So it was fascinating to kind of start with from my own point of view, it was my first hand experience working with kind of like P 
people from Germany, France, Austria, Finland, um, Slovakia, and even America. So the tutor side, it was challenging to kind of agree on our terms on the assessment brief, how we want to do things. And then you see student because we put them into multicultural group. Then you kind of start to see starting from very polite discussions to heated conversation. We even nearly have the fight during our kind of European real estate challenge. But what I would like to kind of say to our students group here is, I think you will find out that employer wanting you to kind of want to see problem solving skill, communication skill, team working skill. But I think part of it deep down is probably your cultural awareness and your cultural intelligence. And we heard Barry, Nicola and Andy and Jam also talk about type of people they work with. So even in the UK, even if you're not thinking about going abroad to work, like going to France to work is not for you, going to Dubai to work is not for you. Within UK, a lot of investment is coming from outside of the UK. So you are going to get opportunity to work with people. Your client might not be British. Your client could be from China, from Malaysia, from Singapore. So you really need to start thinking about how are you going to start, open your eyes, be a bit receptive to different culture because it's a people's job, people industry. And how are you going to build trust with your client going forward with your colleague? It's about you showing the respect, the understanding of different people. And like I say, the first, when, when I was a student, I was really mindful of my language. I keep on thinking that international language is English and I must be kind of like perfect in this. I must increase my proficiencies in, in English. But I think from a native speaker point of view, I think the mo most powerful way for you to kind of, cause you master this language, but how are you actually going to communicate well what you want to say to someone else who is not a native speaker? That is a different element of skill that you need to kind of master as well. So I kind of like doing it reverse, from the panelists here, because you all kind of leave UK and gone somewhere else. I kind of attracted to this mindset like London, um, MRICS, um, the UK culture and everything. But I think we all share the same kind of attitude, um, same different challenge, but same that we found problem, we have problem, we have issue, we have challenges to finding a job. It's about identify yourself, your strength and then in using that to kind of get yourself a job. So I think I was lucky that I was put in a Chinese city situation that I think then my true self came out that my two tutor saw the different side of me. They almost say that why when you speak Chinese, you almost like a different person. I don't know whether it's the tone that the language sound that they thought I was constantly arguing with people on the street in China. Um, it's like, what happened to you, B? You're almost like a different person in China. You were constantly arguing with people. I said, no, I, I wasn't. It's just maybe the sound of Chinese made it sound like I was arguing. Um, totally different person in the UK. But I think I slowly come out from my, my shelf now, uh, hopefully. And I think my journey at SHU has been smooth, but also have some challenge because constantly I'm fighting, fighting with myself, thinking that I have imposter street syndrome. It's like the way I'm now going from a professional coordinator to a lecturer, to a senior lecturer, principal lecturer, to now um, almost eight months as a head of global academic development in the university. Um, I haven't teach in the last year during the pandemic. Uh, very lucky because I haven't have to gone through what my colleague had to go through doing the online teaching, change the way we teach. But I miss that as well. Um, I think I think my biggest kind of learning and also want to share with everyone is like, yes, like what what Barry say, take a risk, um, like Andy say. Do not worry about take the path that is less travel. Um, you, you need to, first of all, define your own self. Everyone has got their unique selling point, the USP. Um, identify what is your key strength. 
And I think be persevere and resilience. I think this is very important time, very, very challenging time for everyone because you've been learning, locked in your own room for so many months now. Um, and they say, yes, property people, we probably crave for like touching people, connecting with people. We suffer from mental health to a different certain degree. Don't be afraid um, and just kind of like be focused of where you want to be. And even though you can't see the end of the light at the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel, but at the moment, it will come. Um, I've been knocked back so many times just because I need a work permit. And I start questioning myself, should I go home? But I didn't regret that I stay 20 years. Uh, I am where I am. I'm very happy, even though I didn't achieve my dream to work in London, but I get to go down to London to see my student, to see the alumni, to, to get the first hand of what they do. I have alumni in Hong Kong, in Shanghai, in America, in Canada. And this is where I kind of make me proud. And this is where I get my kind of the dreams come true through other people. So yeah, everyone got different journey and just, just be yourself and be perseverance and go for it. I have to quickly summarize it, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, B. That absolutely brilliant. That was really, really great. Um, all our talks this morning, it, uh, just sort of to ask, um, uh, to ask a question really, and I'll put it to Sham and then I'll put it to you, B. But what would you say was if you had to sum it up in two words what two characteristics do you think our students need to move forward in a really positive way to try and embrace what you you've actually said if i can put that to sham first i don't know if i could do it in two words but uh <laughs> that's, that's that's a difficult uh, situation but i think i think one thing that b b alluded to was self-doubt I think a lot of people doubt themselves, like, I can't, I won't, it won't happen for me. And I feel that um, if I did that, and this is my parents included, I'm not even talking about careers. If I told my mum I was leaving for Dubai a week before I got the flight, just because my parents coming from an Asian background, no, don't do that, stay at home, do this, you know, buy a house, rent a house, do this, do that. And it's just like, well, I don't want to do that. Like we come from different generations now. Yes, you did it. Yes, you moved from Africa to the UK. You made a life for yourself. I don't want that. I want to go somewhere else. And it was, if I had the self-doubt and, you know, the guilt that, that sometimes you have when you're, you're making very important life decisions, right? The, the, the guilt for not doing something kills me. It kills me. It rots me to, to like shiver, like, wow, like FOMO, like why I should have done that, right? So now doing it and not having that self-doubt and having that inner confidence, because yes, I'm an extrovert, but I still feel the same way that everyone else feels. I still feel nervous. I still have the fear for doing certain things. And it's not to have that self-doubt, do it. And what everyone said on this call is fail. But if you can look up, you can get up. And that's the thing, you get up, you fail and you get up because 100 rejections hurts. It hurts really badly because because you 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 don't want failure no one wants failure no one wants criticism oh you know you can't do something blah blah but you learn from it you get up and you succeed and you get up and you succeed and then if i look back to who i was eight years ago and who i am right now we're two different people we're just two different people because of the self-doubt that i overcame and now i can do anything i want like leaving the corporate world getting paid like hundreds of thousands of dollars to actually earning nothing that's a massive deal and I've got rent, I've got, you know, things to pay, I've got blah, blah, and I'm earning zero money right now. I have five employees, Ayushi's on the call, right? And it hurts that I can't pay them sometimes because I've just made this decision, but I have the vision, I have the journey that this is, we're going to overcome it and that's it. So self-doubt, guys, go forward, have the confidence to move forward. Fantastic, brilliant. B, what do you think? What would you say is maybe two words that you would say our students should be striving for? Initiative, perseverance. Um, I think, yes, university do have a lot of support for students, but I think supports are there. You need to initiate that. And a lot of time, 
you know yourself better, you can carve out a road for yourself. Like very think about, well, okay, it's very competitive in the UK, um, but I have a Hong Kong citizenship. Maybe I should try it out in Hong Kong. And Nicola, you you kind of like travel to Australia, then you want to like, you got bored of like laying on the beach. I, I cannot, try, it's hard to believe that. But anyway, you took the initiative, you rang someone, you offer what you expert in and you got your job and you're still there. And you again, you have your multi-language kind of like ability. Again, you carve your road with your kind of like your, your strength in there. So I think everyone is kind of like doing the same course, yes. But then you as an individual, you have your own unique ability and capability. Be, have the initiative to carve your own road. Be persevere, you will get there. Brilliant, thank you. If I can ask all our participants to come back, if they can turn the screens on, that'd be really great. I think um, I think what I've found it out, I've written down some words and, and these words I hope that the students will listen to because I think, um, and, and I've wrote this down all morning. So when people, you know, have said things, I've written them down. And, and I think the beauty about what we've seen this morning is that, that the impossible is possible. And, um, and I think that for many of our students, the world is your oyster now. You are at the start, you're at the beginning. It takes one step to go that further. And, and the ladies and gentlemen that we've had on this morning have shown us that it's possible. But I think, you know, you've got to, I think there were certain words, build a strong foundation. I thought that was an excellent, build a strong foundation. And I think the one thing that comes over across on everybody is communication. It's we need to talk to each other and we need to network. You need to socialize. You need to be we're in touch. And all right, it's not that hard today, but it's not that difficult. It's very difficult today because of COVID, but we will get out of this. And I think students and I, and I, I know I nag my students about communication, but this is what it's all about. But one thing that's really come across from every single person who's spoken this morning is their passion and enthusiasm for their job. Um, their, their energy and their commitment to that job has been absolutely phenomenal. And that has shone from every single one of you. And I can only thank you for talking to our students because it's been superb to listen to such commitment. And that the, 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 you know, yes, you have been periods where you've been frightened to step off the ladder sort of thing and on to the next. But my word, did you have the resilience and the confidence to think, no, I'm going to do it. So I've, got, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I'll hand back over to Tony and hopefully he can give us some parting words. But fantastic. Thank you very much, guys, all of you. OK, um, yes, I just want to echo my thanks. Um, our time is up. Um, Nicholas had to had to leave us because um, it is past her bedtime. Um, so what I'll do is I'm going to stop recording and say thank you very much. And then once I've done that,